This is Unwind Your Mind Back to God Written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh In today's episode we continue the transfer of training with book 3 In chapter 1 this is section 3 Relationships Lack, Completion and Ownership David Does anyone have anything they want to bring to session as a springboard for discussion? Friend, I had an intense dream last night that was all about the desire for a mate, an ideal mate. It was not even so much about wanting a physical mate. It was about the desire to be with someone who wants me as much as I want them and the feeling of completion that comes from that. I can see the fallacy of how human relationships do not achieve that, but there is still an intense yearning that I was getting in touch with. I was thinking it was probably a distorted miracle impulse. David Yes, it is nice you can make that observation. Even when you think of it along the lines of just relationship and companionship, rather than sexual attraction, it is still coming from the ego. Companionship still has the element of wanting another body just to be there. It is a sense of being with someone else in body, and it still involves the idea of relationships. It involves bodies instead of the pure mind relationship. The feeling of intense yearning really gets to the core of the ego. The ego is continually telling the mind that you must seek outside yourself to complete yourself. The thrust of that yearning comes from a deep, deep feeling of incompletion and the desire to be complete. In the Beyond All Idols section, it says that you have every right to ask for this. Completion is your inheritance. It is just that you are looking in the wrong place. You believe completion lies outside yourself, on the screen. Even the sense of companionship or just someone to be there with you is still a form of that. The special love relationship is the ego's most boasted gift. It is the ace card of the ego, the yearning that seems to be the strongest. There are many yearnings for specific things. But this one seems to be the one the mind believes is kind of the end all. If I could just have that, then life would be bearable. Everything else would matter not if I had that. That is just another trick. People who have tried to play that out find that even what they think is the ideal companion, of course, is not. There is not that sense of completion. It is not like they come to the end of the rainbow with that. The mind is still looking. This is great. Now what is next? What else can I add? The feeling you can add something else should be a clue the ego is at work. As we join in community, this topic will come up. One person will seem to stand out more than the rest and be attractive in some way. You will notice it come up and it will obscure the complete equality of the sonship. It will always obscure the true identity. 
until it is completely transcended, the draw will always seem very attractive, at times intensely attractive. What you are describing is kind of like the jewel in the ego's crown. The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ is a book about Jesus going through all these temptations. In Egypt, he gets to number six, I believe. And it is described as the angel idol. A woman of entrancing beauty comes to Jesus as he is sitting in contemplation. She does not even say a word. She just sits down and starts to sing songs of Israel. She sings these beautiful songs, some of them of his upbringing, of his life. And then she gets up and leaves. Not even a word is spoken. The way it is described is that the passions were stirred in the heart of Jesus. She would periodically come back and it was a period of unrest for Jesus and very much a temptation. After all these other temptations, deceit and different things, it is like, here is this. It was a 40-day temptation again. The 40 days seems to be a number that comes up. For 40 days was he tempted. Then he arose and said, Am I to be the demonstration of unconditional love? This divine love that comes not from this world? He talked to her. He told her that their paths would cross, but that he had to go on and do what he had to do. Reading those kinds of stories while working with the Course helped bring it all together for me. You cannot have impersonal love and personal love. They cannot go together. That is a great little parable about temptation. Eventually, when you really follow it in and come to your right mind, so to speak, you see that they cannot come together. They cannot be mixed. Thinking about that yearning in terms of a distorted miracle impulse gives you a sense of the power of love or the power of the miracle just by the strength of it because it seems to be coming through the ego's lens it is perceived as a lack can you imagine the strength of it without that lens when it comes through the ego as a distorted miracle impulse it is felt as intense yearning but when you are able to lay aside the ego it comes straight into consciousness without going through the ego's lens. It is quite powerful. Our friend was feeling this enormous urge to extend, feeling like she is going to explode. It is hard to stifle it. Once you really go with it for a while, it becomes just a tremendous urge to extend and be of help. It is kind of like in the movie Groundhog Day. Phil goes through all these things over and over and over, trying to manipulate people and get Rita in bed, etc. Until finally he gets this uncontrollable urge to be helpful. He starts going around fixing tires on cars. He catches a child falling out of a tree. He saves a guy's life with the Hemlick maneuver. Everywhere he goes, he looks for some ways to be helpful. It is like an uncontrollable urge. And that is what got him out of the loop. Linear time is a loop 
where the past just seems to repeat over and over and over. That is what makes the movie Groundhog Day such a powerful metaphor. Not only can you see the loop, which is symbolic of the loop that everyone has experienced, but you also see a metaphor for the way out of the loop, which is just to be totally helpful, to completely lose yourself in the urge to be truly helpful. It is intense. You will experience that. There is no doubt about it. Friend, can, can we talk about expectations? In meditation, I was feeling that to have expectations of anyone based on what they said in the past will always be hurtful. I cannot trust what anyone says. I can only trust who they are. I can only trust the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit in them. And I cannot trust anything in form nor have the expectations in that area. David The deceived mind has a very deep-rooted belief in scarcity, lack, unworthiness and guilt. That is what the special relationships of the world are all about. Perceiving oneself as a person and perceiving your brothers as persons and bodies is all set up to solve the problem of guilt. In other words, the world was made as an attempt to solve the problem of guilt. The world was made as an attempt to solve the problem of lack. The world was made as an attempt to solve the problem of scarcity. The belief that one can adjust to the world and find fulfillment and completion in that adjustment is erroneous. When you trace expectations back, you will find that they are always about a belief in incompletion or a belief in lack that is still there in the mind. Why would it be important what someone else said? Why would it be important what somebody else did? Why would anything in the world be important for that matter if one had an inner sense of completion? The lack and the incompletion are what have to be questioned. Those who see themselves as whole make no demands. Workbook Lesson 37 That is a great line. Can you see how it does not leave any room for expectations? Those who see themselves as whole are not at the mercy of anyone or anything. Friend, consequently, they would have no expectations because there would be nothing perceived as needed. David And of course, in that scenario, they could not be upset. They could not be unfairly treated based on a seeming change in what someone said or did. They could not perceive themselves as unfairly treated. They could not perceive someone as breaking their word or doing something against them when they see themselves as the dreamer of the dream and no longer perceive attack. Lack, incompletion or scarcity is what has to be addressed. The fundamental thing that we keep, we will keep going over many, many, many times is that the deceived mind does not know what giving is and therefore it does not know how to extend. It does not see that giving and receiving are equal, the same. How many times have we heard clichés in this world about the importance of giving or even the clichés about it being better to give than to receive? Even that is off. Friend, because you cannot give without receiving? 
David. The mind gets exactly what it wants. And it is and it is always giving and receiving. It is impossible that it be better to give than receive, because they are the same. You cannot place one higher than the other. The key thing is that the deceived mind does not have a clue what giving is. It believes in the ego. It believes in form and specifics. Believing in specifics It does not know what giving is. Giving does not, in the end, have anything to do with specifics. Neither does extending. As long as the mind feels incomplete and has expectations of other people, or even expectations of the person that it identifies as its self, that has to be the ego talking. Christ does not put pressure on himself. It is the ego that does the pressuring. It is the ego that sets up personal expectations, like living up to somebody else's standards or living up to the standards one sets for oneself. It is not the capital self doing that. It is the ego. In the end, The only realization you are ever asked to come to is that having and being are the same. Having and being or giving and receiving are the same. The mind that is asleep thinks it is in the world. It associates itself with a person, with a body, and it associates everything in the world with specifics. Therefore, it believes in personal possessions. It believes it possesses a body. The body is probably the deceived mind's most prized possession of all the things in this world of possessions. That is why in the cases of rape and incest, there seems to be such a deep wound the mind feels like it has been personally violated because the mind identifies with the body. When something is done to the body, there is a strong sense of violation and victimization. The deceived mind thinks it possesses a body and it thinks it possesses other things like green paper strips, houses, cars, clothing, jewelry, and computers. Just fill in the blank of all the things of the world. Dogs, cats, biological family, members, etc. It may even think it possesses a religion. The list just goes on and on and on. All of it reflects the confusion about having. It thinks it has these things. But in truth, that is not what having means. You cannot have a hundred dollars. You cannot have a husband. You cannot have a body. And you cannot have talent, say for playing the piano or playing baseball. You cannot have mathematical ability. You cannot have high IQ or verbal ability. You cannot have any of that because none of it is real. How can you have something that is not real? The Course teaches that what you have is what you are. That is it. That is what having means. Having and being are identical. Do you see how the recognition of that would bring an end to all seeking outside oneself on the screen? It brings an end to expectations, to expecting others to do what they said they would do, or however you have it constructed. This is all. This is all it takes. It is free. This realization is free. It does not cost anything. 
There is no cost associated with recognizing that what you have is what you are. It is given. It was given to you when you were created by God and nothing can take that away from you. You can cover it up in your consciousness. You can bury it. You can deny it. You can keep it out of awareness. But you cannot destroy it and you cannot change it. You can just accept it. Friend, and it is the associations that cover it over? All those things you said you cannot have, it is like you you can associate with them, but you cannot have them. And it is one or the other. Actually, it is only one. But it seems in awareness to be one or the other. David, I was reading a helpful passage from the attainment of the real world section. Ownership is a dangerous concept if it is left to you. The ego wants to have things for salvation. For possession is its law. Possession for its own sake is the ego's fundamental creed a basic cornerstone in the churches it builds to itself. And at its altar, it demands you lay all of the things it bids you get, leaving you no joy in them. Everything the ego tells you that you need will hurt you. For although the ego urges you again and again to get, It leaves you nothing. For what you get, it will demand of you. And even from the very hands that grasped it, it will be wrenched and hurled into the dust. For where the ego sees salvation, it sees separation. And so you lose whatever you have gotten in its name. Therefore, Ask not of yourself what you need, for you do not know, and your advice to yourself will hurt you. For what you think you need will merely serve to tighten up your world against the light and render you unwilling to question the value that this world can really hold for you. Text, Chapter 13, Section 7 Along the way, the Holy Spirit can use the concept of ownership while the mind still believes in it. The Holy Spirit works with the mind where it perceives itself. The concept of ownership can be part of the backdrop. However, once you pull the concept of ownership out of the backdrop, so to speak, and you really believe you can own things, then it is dangerous. Notice that your peace of mind is out of the window when you really believe that you possess something. Whether it is a body, money, a car, a jewel, it does not matter what. It could be anything you will notice immediately that your peace of mind is gone because you will be defending that thing, whatever it is. There have been those that have misinterpreted this issue, thinking that renting something is not owning it. It does not bring you peace to think that you can just shift the form of ownership, of owning something to that of leasing it. It should be so easy that you just lease everything. A little shift in form does nothing. You have to question every value in your mind if you want to let go of ownership and release the ego. Text, chapter 14, section 8.